I think Zoomed Laboratories is probably one of the most recognizable brands in herpeticulture. They've been around since 1977 and in 1993 were the first brand to actually produce UVB lamps specifically for reptiles. Later on in this episode, we're going to learn more about a Zoomed product that is specifically designed for bearded dragons. So if you own a bearded dragon or you want to in the future, you will not want to miss this. This podcast is all about improving your reptile husbandry. However, I know not everybody has the time or the money to go out and spend thousands of dollars doing custom builds. Thankfully, friend of the podcast, Josh Halter, aka The Bio Dude, is working hard to make better care more accessible. He makes turnkey bioactive kits for leopard geckos, ball pythons, tortoises, invertebrates, dart frogs, and the list continues to grow. He has spent years testing and perfecting these handcrafted substrates and dietary supplements to create the most effective products. If you visit thebiodude.com, you will see he is a proud supporter of both US ARC and Responsible Reptile Keeping, and there is an option to donate to either at checkout. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Ellie Hills. Ellie is the co-host of the Reptiles and Research podcast, as well as the creator of the Hills Herptile YouTube channel. Ellie has a degree in animal management and a master's in applied zoo biology, and this episode is really partitioned into three sections. The first section, we discuss animal welfare and how to increase your animal's ability to cope with their captive environment. If the word welfare makes you scared, this is an episode you should listen to. We discuss why it's so such an important concept and how to actually implement it in our captive care and how to improve the welfare of the animals that we keep. The middle of this episode is focused on training. What are some ways you can actually interact with your animal in a positive way and actually understanding how training works for your reptiles with snakes, lizards, it doesn't matter. And understanding the difference between positive and negative reinforcement and positive and negative punishment, which I think are four terms that many people get confused. So Ellie clears that up for us and we wrap up the conversation with a discussion on the ball python study that her, Lori Torini, and Liam Sinclair have spearheaded over the past few months. This is the largest behavioral analysis of captive ball pythons that I think has ever been done. Maybe don't quote me on that, but I think it is probably the largest one, especially something that's come out of her, her pediculture itself. It is fascinating. So Ellie breaks down how that study worked, what they were looking for, and how they collected data. And I cannot wait to see the results of that when they do come out. So at the end of the conversation, that's where you're going to want to tune in if you want to hear more about that. As always, this episode has been recorded and produced by me, Dylan Perrin, and edited by Liam Sinclair of Reptiles and Research. Enjoy the episode. Well, Ellie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Hello. I feel like it's been a while since I've appeared. <laughs> it, it seems like it. But you've not, I guess you have been on the podcast once. We did the roundtable for Leopard Gecko with uh, Liam and, and Adam Wickens. But is that the only time you've been on this podcast? No, I think we did like an introductory episode yes, before right. we launched. Yeah. Right. So that was like two years ago for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's been a while. So, so I, I was, I'm, you've been on my list for a long time. I, I'm really excited to talk to you because I think there's so many different areas we can investigate for people that uh, will be very worthy for them. Can, let, let's just start with a little bit of background, maybe just education and, and animal wise. What have you been up to? Is this something that's been part of your whole life or is it something that started a little bit later? Yeah, I mean, pretty much since I can remember, I think it's like every reptile keeper's arc, isn't it? Oh, when I was a kid, I was in the garden playing with newts. Um, I was always like, my mom was very kind in allowing me to raise tadpoles and things like that. Um, and was always really understanding and kind of encouraged me to do so. Um, and then I went to college um, to study animal management. And then from there, it kind of like snowball rolled. So um, I managed to do like loads of cool stuff. Um, like I've been in aquariums, target training sharks. Um, and like I was involved in like training programs with octopus and things like that. Um, and then I worked all my way up into doing a uh, master's in applied zoo biology. Um, and then currently now I'm working um, as a supervisor in the UK's largest charity um, for cats and dogs. So, yeah, I've kind of got like a really weird, wide variety of um, experience in animals, I guess. Have you always, like, even from when you were a kid, did you know that you want to work with animals? Like, did you, Or did you have a path? Like, did you think you'd end up in the zoo space or or you just wanted to be around animals? Um, I, yeah, when I was younger, I always envisioned zookeeping. I didn't really, I did really like animal welfare and things like that. Um, and I kind of like stumbled on it career wise. Um, I always liked exotic things. However, I think, yeah, every animal I've been willing to work with, it's never been just one sole focus. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as far as reptile keeping goes, is that something that you've done for a long time? Yeah. So I got my first reptile when I was 
um, 16, 17. So that's, yeah, over 10 years now. And because I'm very curious about how the, because you had mentioned, you know, welfare is something that you stumbled in, uh, stumbled, stumbled across at some point, I guess, in your education. So I, I want to know how that happened, but also how did that layer over top of reptiles? So so maybe we'll, we'll start with, you know, you, you got your first reptile. Did your collection do like the, the classic, you know, snowball up to a, a bunch of different animals quite quickly? Um, so for the first couple of years, I had um, an awful starter, which was a Yemen chameleon. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I took on a rescue one. Someone was just giving him away for free. Um, and unfortunately, I had him in his worst years of life. Um, so my first kind of like reptile keeping was actually supportive care. Um, and then I got a crested gecko who I still have now called Spyro. Um, and then for my education time I kind of like had a gap and then yeah from there it kind of like snowballed and I started building up a collection and then is that when you got into keeping ball pythons at that point yeah so then I got a couple more chameleons because they're a great passion of mine and then yeah I got into the royal python world and it snowballed because suddenly there were loads of them that needed homes and I was the sucker. <laughs> mm. So were you do, were, were you trying to breed or anything or you were just accepting animals that needed homes? I, at the time, I thought that I could breed a couple of clutches and then that would be okay and I would um, be able to like upgrade everything in the reptile room and it was kind of like a justification for it. Um, but then I, I was awful with business sense. I couldn't let them go to just anyone I took on way too many animals that needed homes opposed to like business sense animals and things like that. And I very kind of quickly realized this isn't the path for me. Yeah. yeah I just, I, I, yeah, I can't make those clinical business um, decisions at all. So then tell me about when the welfare aspect you, you stumbled across. And I, I, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit further. Like we'll get into it in a much more detail in a little bit, but for the listeners, you know, you, you, we may have, when you say the word welfare, people may have already hit the off switch on the podcast because they're so terrified yeah. fight of it. So uh, let, maybe tell us about how, how you stumbled across it and maybe the, the impact it had on you when you initially started thinking that way. Yeah. So um, obviously when you start going to animal college and things like that, it's a big, it's a big buzzword. Um, and it's something that they kind of briefly cover as a topic, like this is what it is. And then when I actually started working, as a job in an animal welfare sector, it kind of makes it very real, if that makes sense. Um, and it's a job that I applied for. And I was like, there's no way I'm getting this job because I've obviously very clearly like gone towards the zoo world. And that's controversial in itself when you talk about animal welfare. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I just landed on my feet. And um, it's kind of made me really not fluffy. So I very much have a clinical mind of what is a life worth living? What is a, what, um, I never want to keep an animal selfishly. I never want to put an animal in a position where it's going to suffer. And sometimes that comes across really harsh. Um, yeah, I've definitely lost my fluffiness when it comes to these things. So when you started contemplating these concepts, did you go back home into your reptile room and think, okay, I need to make some changes here or, or like, because like my experience with learning about welfare and, and caring for animals properly is you, you, there's a tremendous amount of guilt that comes with keeping reptiles. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's hard to avoid that. You just sort of hit that hits you. And then you walk into your reptile room and you, A, you're wondering if this is even the right thing to be doing at all. And B, if you, if it is right, how do you change? Did you have that experience as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it made me really sit back and the animals that I was taking on because I was trying to do better for them. Was I doing any better for them? Mm. Like, am I able to take that animal on and give it a life worth living? Um, and really how much does that impact on every other animal? So every animal I get, I take something from everyone else. So is it worth the impact that it has on everyone else and not just on that one animal as well? Mm. Um, you can overstretch yourself and it doesn't just impact that new animal that you took on. It impacts everyone. Yeah. Did you ever compartmentalize the welfare aspect? Because I think sometimes it, for, for many people, it's easy to think about welfare when we're talking about mammals or like, you know, higher order beings, whatever they are, you know, th things that are more complex primates and whatnot. But then quite often reptiles and things that are amphibians, 
even inverts and things like that kind of fall off the wagon as far as like, do they even need to be included in the welfare conversation? When you started investigating welfare for you, was it just a holistic, every animal deserves to, to be talked about in this setting or, or, or were you able to, or were you kind of thinking like, did, did it take you time to bring the reptiles into that conversation? It didn't take me time to bring the reptiles in, but the, the surrounding things like the invertebrates and things like that, I didn't think about ethics for them at all. And then obviously wandering into welfare, the more you learn, you're like, actually, everything can suffer. And it can not yeah, it made me realize that you can't just, even like a reptile, there's those surrounding things that get impacted, like your invertebrates and things like that, that can, yeah, impact things. Mm-hmm. And, and so this is where I think people get very nervous about this. Con- I, I don't even know why people get I guess I could figure out why people get nervous about this conversation because they're afraid that A, of probably feeling guilt of making an animal suffer and, and then B, arming animal rights groups with too much of in, too much information, which will allow, you know, a, a, end up shooting ourselves in the foot effectively by saying like maybe we shouldn't be doing this in captivity. But uh, Liam and, and you, yourself had sent me a video a couple of days ago uh, for an organization called Wild Welfare. I don't know how much you know about them, but for the listener, they're, they're an organization that I think is really, you know, spearheading welfare and captivity for animals and it's a it's a really fascinating thing there's there's a bunch of online resources that are free for people about enclosure design and treating animals and health and, and creating you know proper nutrition plans I'll, I'll put that in the show notes for people but one of the things that i think that i, I thought was perfectly put is she whoever I, I don't even remember her name she basically said care is the husbandry practices that you implement and welfare is the experience the animal has based on those practices that you are implementing. And I think that's a perfectly put. And I don't think any animal can escape that definition because every animal mm-hmm. is experiencing the the, the the husbandry that you're providing it. Yeah. And I feel like she covered it quite beautifully in there where no one, you can't pin a lot of people down what is welfare a lot of people really struggle with finding that definition um for me i always go off of and there's this great scientist called broom if you ever look he's been doing welfare since the 90s Um, and the definition that he came up for me was just the state of an animal's coping because welfare we always take it as like a negative connotation but it just means the state of the animal that it is and you can have negative welfare um just neutral or positive and i think yeah, it really welfare is just compacting the state that the animal is in at the time. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that coping defi- definition. It's how is the animal coping with the environment that you've given it? And I, I think as keepers, it is so easy, especially as reptile keepers, it's so easy to forget that the animal is effectively trapped in the environment that you've given it. Mm. And tra- trapped, I know, is a negative word, but you want to almost think of it that way because you, the, the, the freedoms that they have within their environment are quite low. You, the, the better design you have for an enclosure, the more choice the animal have, the more freedoms they have, and, and that will aid in their ability to cope with, with their, their environment. But it, I, I don't know why it becomes a, such a sensitive topic for people. I, I, I guess, you know, because quite often this conversation, both you and I will be painted as like weird snowflakes that think that reptiles need to wear sweaters and that they're, they're sort of being over-personified. But I... I don't, I don't understand. I mean, maybe you have an insight on this, but it seems bizarre that you, we can't actually think about how that reptile is, is experiencing their captive home. Yeah. I, I don't know if it just, yeah, makes people feel uncomfortable. I think a lot of subjects make people feel uncomfortable when it comes to welfare. Um, euthanasia is a big one that makes people feel uncomfortable. Um, the fact that an animal could be suffering, even if, like she was saying, that you're providing good care, like that doesn't define whether or not an animal is coping or not. Um, and rather than reflecting, a lot of people will push that away because they don't want to face that. And that's like completely understandable. I understand why people feel that uncomfortable, but it needs to be a topic that it, the more you discuss it, the more you kind of get an understanding of it, the more you kind of yeah, get comfortable with it. It's not a taboo thing. It's not a shame. Just because I work in a welfare charity, it doesn't make me an anti. I'm not out here to get anyone. Yeah. Um, which I, yeah, I find it really difficult as well because I'm not very open with people when I meet them, my workplace, because I get such like a negative, like, oh, they're an anti. I'm, like, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> like, yeah. I like um, keeping reptiles too. I just think that we need to do better. Yeah. 
Exactly. And I, I think it's a totally fair and valid conversation. And, and one of the questions that she had asked in this presentation, again, I'll, I'll make sure that's in the show notes for, for people to go listen to was, and I, and I think many people listening, this will be an obvious answer, but the question she posed was, is, is longevity and reproduction a sign of good welfare? And I think many of us immediately default to say, we, we know that rep- re- reproduction is not an indication of welfare because people animals will breed in almost like horrid conditions. But longevity is one where it's like a bit tricky, right? Where you think, well, if the animal lived a long life, it must have been healthy. But there's so many different mm-hmm. examples of animals or even people that can live long lives but have extremely low welfare. I mean, it's not it's not how you want to exist in the world. So it, it does just leave us with the question about what are, what's the animal experiencing? How can we make it better for them? And w- without making people feel bad, really, it's, you know, just taking baby steps, I think, is key. And I think like there was something um, I watched someone talking in a discussion the other day and they were like, an animal doesn't have an, an understanding of longevity. Like my gecko doesn't have an understanding that it could live for 15 years. And that, so that's not a justification for an animal being kept poorly because he could go on for another 10 years. He doesn't know that he lives in the moment every single day. And if you can make sure that in the moment he's good, then we're all grand. But if we're saying, oh, his welfare is going to be poor for the next two years, but then it's going to get better, he doesn't know that. And that's a very human thing to be like, oh, well, he could live for so much more. No animal thinks that. Mm -hmm. Well, I I want to talk about the euthanasia piece. So this is like a little bit of a sad and darker piece. And then we'll (laughs) talk about some areas of how you can actually bump up welfare. Simple things that people can implement that, that can actually justify us keeping these animals in captivity you know, rightly so. So the euthanasia piece is interesting because I think the the argument for the other side is let, let's just make a fictitious uh, rescue of some sort that says, well, I'm going to save every animal that's in a rough condition. Yes, I don't have space for these 80 animals, but I'm going to jam pack them into the small space and at least give them life. It's not a high quality life, but at least it's life and saving them from a, from a situation where, and I think if we look at it from a welfare standpoint, euthanasia quickly comes into that conversation, but it's also really uncomfortable for people because most people would think an animal existing is better than it not existing, even if the conditions are bad. So where do you sit on this? Um, I sit on, I would prefer, um, there is no welfare problem when an animal is put to sleep. It is um, one of the kindest things that you can do for an animal if it's in a state of suffering. Um, I wish that I could be um, treated in the same way that animals get treated that almost like bubble wrapped like we don't have to suffer um i don't feel uncomfortable with if there's like you hear horror stories of like boa's been kept in like tiny drawers for years at upon time because they can because they're in the rescue and they they don't have space that animal is in such a state of like sat in a box with no understanding that it's ever going to get out of there um i think it's far kinder to put the animal to sleep before it knows that suffering than to draw it out in the hope that one day it's going to get better and we know realistically that we have way too many boas or way too many um, reticulated pythons or these big monitors that have nowhere to go. So really, for me, the kindest thing would be to do is not let that animal suffer. And unfortunately, when you haven't got any other choice, that, that is euthanasia. Yeah. And yeah, you bring that into the conversation, even if the animal isn't physically or or or, or medically has an issue right it's it, it's you're basically just saying saying is there any way to change this condition of this animal's captive environment and if the answer is no for the foreseeable future putting the animal to sleep actually does make sense yeah and i guess i don't understand why people are so uncomfortable with that as a concept but they will sit there and eat a burger and i'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that that that's absolutely fine um but why why it's because we're so emotionally invested in one and not the other Mm. like we wouldn't if you were like oh all of these cows are crammed into a tiny pen and they've got nowhere to go what would you do everyone would be like well obviously we can make burgers from them that's fine Mm. but as soon as we put it like a reptile snake that we see as a pet we're like i can't that's that's horrific and both have the same level of ability to suffer yeah and i think I mean, even if we look at, uh, so, so that's an interesting point, the ability to suffer. So I want to jump back to that in a second, but also just even the way, I mean, this is getting really dark here, but but <laughs> the way humans operate, you know, uh, uh, putting someone 
uh, how do you say this? Like kill, kill, basically killing somebody is typically more merciful than torturing somebody. That's why torturing is such an effective way. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, it's not something that you're even supposed to do as far as w- the war laws or whatever they are. I don't want to get too far into politics here, but, but torture is obviously something that is, is a tool to, to, to punish people at the maximum extent. And if, if you can consider an environment like a solitary confinement or something like that being a, a torturous experience, many people would think that death is is an easier thing so but i think doubling back to the the ability to experience suffering is that's maybe the speed bump that people hit people think okay humans can suffer uh chimps can suffer cows can suffer a little bit less than that um birds maybe a little bit less than that fish even less maybe reptiles almost nothing at all and an ant can't suffer at all i i imagine that's where the the slope lies something along those lines so do you do you say a human and an and a frog can suffer to the same extent essentially that's where it gets really tricky so we know that frogs have the ability to feel pain but we cannot scientifically say that a frog has a, an emotional response to that suffering uh, or pain that results in the same suffering as a person however we do know that that frog can experience stress and it does get distressed and it can have physical symptoms resulting from stress levels. Um, But whether or not we can say that it's exactly the same experience, we can't. Yeah. And this is where until we like scientifically prove it, you're always going to have people who are like, well, they can't, but I would rather treat animals as if they could. And then if they can't, it doesn't matter rather than reflect back and be like, Oh damn! <laughs> like exactly. Whoops. Exactly. Like w- we might as well treat them as if they can suffer from being in a poor condition, because the the worst case scenario in that case is that they just have a really nice enclosure and a great environment, and they don't care anyway. Rather than the opposite of, of this like torturous kind of experience. So, I I think that that's a great kind of platform to to stand on as far as like how do we do this? How do we actually make sure that the animals in our care are coping well with their with their environments? I. I, I is that too general of a question to start with? Um, <laughs> I think the way that you can measure it, a lot of there's a brilliant Melfi paper that is like the foundation for positive welfare for me. That's where it started um, about talking about positive experiences. So just having neutral welfare where there is no, you're just living your everyday life. There's nothing good happening. There's nothing bad happening. Doesn't result in a good life. So can we definitively say that the animals in our care have positive things that are happening for them? Um, For example, we know that turtles will exhibit play Mm -hmm. if you give them toys and things like that. So it's kind of like encouraging natural behaviors, having different outlets for a range of different things. And then do we see those positive things happening as well? Um, Which is difficult because how do we define that? Because we don't know. A lot of animals, we have no idea how they would express those positive things in the first place. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's where mammals become much simpler because play is very recognizable. We're mammals as well. So you see a dog or a, or a, a lion or something like that playing. It's so clear that that's, that's a, a positive experience. We can relate to it identically. But when you're dealing with reptiles, that is that is very difficult. And you, you can't... So, so that... I, I think a good starting place is trying to give them opportunities to display natural behavior, right? I think that that typically is something that most a- animals are sort of ingrained to do their natural behavior. So if you give them those opportunities, but it's hard to tell when you, you know, another example in that video, that, that, that presentation was using puzzle feeders and you can see an animal interacting with the puzzle feeder and that looks like good. It's an engaging activity, or is it actually just frustrating that animal to the point where he's getting depressed and it's hard to actually make that 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 distinguishing piece. Like, is this the right thing to do or is this the wrong thing to do? I I, I don't know. How, how do you do this? <laughs> yeah, I think um, as much as you can, try and look at natural activity budgets. So if an animal on average spends three hours a day feeding, then that is that internal motivation will be to spend that time doing that. And if you, I think like she quite nicely put it, the input and the output. So the same amount of bugs could be input and you use it in so many different ways. You could just give it to them in a dish or you could make them work and forage and spend those three hours doing it. Your resource is the same, but it's the way the animal can process it 
that makes such a difference. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of a couple episodes ago that I recorded with Thomas Marriott when he went to New Caledonia. And that was one thing with feeding crested geckos, uh, like a, a powdered diet is, is a very easy way for them to eat. They just go and lick it out of the bowl and it, you know, it's nutritious and it's good for them, but you could actually better simulate fruit falling to the forest floor by just putting that bowl in different spots and forcing them to kind of go smell it or even just smearing it on the ground somewhere on some leaf litter and having them go down and lick it off the floor. Like there are different ways that you can just imagine how that animal is going to acquire food in the wild and, and, and try to simulate that the best way possible. And I think another way that is becoming a lot more acceptable to talk about in the reptile community is just training in general. And mm-hmm. I know that you have a, do, do you have a background in training or is this just something that you've done through your degree or, or working with, with animals? So, um, I obviously to do the college and the degree and the masters, I've had like elements of training within them. I'm, absolutely not a trained trainer i'm not accredited um i do have a fear free accreditation um which is basically that i um when working in the shelter and things like that i have an understanding of working with animals in a fear free manner um i do work alongside and i manage some behaviorists but the difficulty is there is no currently like accredited like reptile trainer kind of role so i'm waiting for that to kind of come out yeah well, I'm sure it will eventually because it does, even in, the, even in the time that I've run this podcast, it seems like animal reptile training obviously has become, become a lot more popular. And, 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 and I, I want to get to the training in a second, but I, I, I just remembered that I wanted to kind of tie up one loose end. Is So for people that are at home wondering, okay, what do I do with my animal? I think A, staying focused on the natural behaviors, trying to give them those opportunities. B, I think the choice is, is key. And that was something that I wanted to mention that I, I, I didn't. And one of the other examples from that video was using like a, a jungle gym or something for your snake, which seems like a very interactive experience for that animal. It's using its energy and, and muscles and it's investigating, but it could actually be a horrible experience for it if you yanked it out of its nice warm hide and, and then put it on this this new jungle gym for it to play on. And we, we can't recognize if it's a stressed behavior or if it's an investigation kind of re- relaxed behavior as easily. So choice, I think, is at the heart of all of this, giving the animal choice. Yeah, and I think like I, us controlling when they can use a resource completely takes away the choice. It's like saying to prisoners that they get to exercise in a yard for an hour. Mm. Like, yes, they do. And we probably spend less time going out most days than an hour into the garden to have a potter around. But the fact that they get dictated to when they get to use that resource makes it so much more difficult for them. Mm. So do you think that the inside of the enclosure really ought to be at the highest level possible. That's where people should put most of their energy and time and focus on making the enclosure better. However that is by adding enrichment, climbing opportunities, swimming opportunities, burrowing, and then probably some enrichment with feeding. Is that where you're like the most bang for your buck is as far as improving their ability to cope? Yeah. I think the more they have control of when they can use it, where like all the different choices within an enclosure make such a difference. And even like she was saying with the drafts in, in that um, talk, like giving them the same brows every day is boring. Or um, for example, we can use the Crested Gecko. You could do little amounts of lots of different flavors and put that all around the enclosure. And therefore the Crested Gecko gets to think about A, what flavor it wants to eat, B, which one's more exciting. And it like adds more excitement and encourages them to use the brain and explore and which flavor do they go for first and things like that opposed to one bowl in a corner of the enclosure that they go to every single time Mm -hmm. yes and you're not necessarily going to notice a a huge difference that's the that's the challenge with reptiles is you know a a happy or happy in quote healthy snake is going to be sitting there curled up basking and one that's maybe depressed is going to be curled up basking and depressed is i know people say well that's a human emotion well it's actually not because we have very similar neurotransmitters and hormones that run through our body and reptile body yeah there's there's some slight chemical differences but they operate in the same way so you can actually have a depressed snake for example or an anxious or a a stressed snake i don't think anyone would argue that or maybe maybe somebody would but they shouldn't (laughs) but it it is hard to see like is that is that a stressed up animal so you, you you do have to just a watch watch them, but then pay attention to how they're interacting with things. I guess. Yeah, and it's so much more difficult because a lot of stress behaviors in mammals are real clear communications. Like a dog 
stress do you have a real understanding so behaviorally and body language trying to show you that they are well so there's a lot for a lot of reptiles it's a shut down state where they are sedentary quiet but it's that like you say you could just mistake it for an animal just laying there and you mm-hmm. wouldn't ever really know yeah yeah that was one term i learned from Lori torini which was learned helplessness Mm-hmm. And which is a really sad thing to think about, but it, it and, and people can have that as well. People can experience, people can be trained to, to know that their behavior and their actions have little to zero impact on whatever they're trying to have happen. And then they'll give up on that said thing, whatever it is. And, and that's sad as well, but it is sad to think, you know, a snake sitting in a, in a rack. Oh yeah. It's not trying to get out of the rack, but maybe it tried that for five years and now it's realized that, that, you know, that's, that's a, a futile exercise. So, Getting back to the training, I, th- I think this is a really interesting area for people to work with their animals and enrich them, their their lives, and, and again, getting back to helping them cope with captivity. Can, can we lay out some definitions and, and terms for people when, when it comes to operant conditioning? Because I think people use like positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, punishment. They don't really know what those terms mean a lot of times, and they're just sort of... You know, anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll let you run with, with, with some of those definitions. <laughs> So we call it the four quadrants, and that is um, negative reinforcement, um, positive reinforcement, negative punishment, positive punishment. Um, So negative reinforcement is rewarding an animal through taking something away. So, for example, it might be um, pressure. So I've gone to put my hand into enclosure. The animal um, has shown me a positive response. I take my pressure away. Um, positive reinforcement is giving that animal something so giving that animal locust the rat or anything like that um positive punishment is me this is usually the controversial one giving some kind of punishment so um classic season milan um pulling on a dog collar to snap it to tell it off and things like that um and then negative punishment is taking away a valued resource as a punishment so that might be um taking a, a a dog's toy away from them because they're doing something that's perceived as naughty or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, the ones that you usually see that are mainly used in the positive reinforcement is the negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement. Right. Yeah, I think that's where people get confused is they don't realize the positive and, and the negative. They just mean a positive means you're adding a stimulus and negative means you're removing a stimulus. It's not, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean positive is good. It's like positive punishment. Oh, that's great. Mm-hmm. I'm like, spanking you but happy <laughs> it's, you're adding the stimulus to this environment and so when you look at those four quadrants and you said most of it's on when we're talking about training reptiles and we're talking about doing it in the way that the academics the academic work is actually saying is the most effective is that that's mostly positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement yeah in the right connotation so there's something coercive called um coercive positive reinforcement and that is when you're holding a valued resource such as a locust and you're encouraging that animal and it's called luring when you lure that animal towards you and their emotions might be a fear state so they're scared and you're asking them to be brave and pull themselves out of that comfort zone because that resource is so valuable to them Mm -hmm. we have to remember a lot of reptiles um live in a state of that locust might be the only locust i see this week so i need to get it um, and because of that, a lot of the times they'll push themselves over a comfort threshold just to get it. Um, whereas now the more we're moving towards negative reinforcement, so rewarding that animal for creating space and getting itself to a comfortable position and being in a better emotional state when we're um, interacting with them, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, anybody who works with kids like I do, you know that you you can't force them to do anything i mean you you can uh, unfortunately when when you're an adult and you're dealing with kids you can't actually force them to do things and it's never a good idea you know i work with athletes and you trying to force them to do a, a race that they don't want to do is a terrible idea and normally it creates a, a quite a bit of trauma with that event we'll say like just, you could just pick any swimming event for example and then you force like a kid to do that out of their own comfort zone if they weren't willing to step up to do it, then it's just going to be a, an incredibly negative experience. And it basically, it's one step forward, two steps back. So mm-hmm. I can totally see what you're saying with this course of positive reinforcement is th- this animal doesn't actually want to jump out of its enclosure and, and chase a locust around. 
but it's doing so because it knows that, or it, it, it just, it, it's just that that resource is so valuable that it's willing to essentially put its entire life at risk. So when you see those videos of people, like a monitor or something chasing a, a food item, even though it looks like, hey, it's we're stimulating hunting, that's not how you see it. No, and a lot of the time, I mean, obviously I don't keep monster lizards, but I can like see the behavior the animal is like stretching itself out it's trying to make itself reach it whilst trying to keep as back as possible and then as soon as it's got that resource it's running back to that safety that means that that animal felt uncomfortable it was frightened it's grabbed the resource and it's run back to safety so you know the whole time that that animal was worried mm. um which then i see like videos of it going um I'll send. I'll have to send the video to. But there's a monitor lizard where he's getting it to come out. It kind of like rushes out to grab, grabs his thumb. It, he then drops the reptile, and then it's just running around on the floor in a panic. Like that whole interaction was because the animal felt uncomfortable. It was stressed. It was trying to do things in a rush. When really, it would have been nice if he'd let the reptile come forward. It showed like just positive, like it's come in your space, and then offering to throw the locust the other side out away from yourself that's reinforcing giving space um allowing the animal to think going back to your comfort zone is a good thing um because you don't that's when you get into the zone of being a danger to yourself and any animal it happens in dogs um that's when bites happen and things like that oh but i was giving him cheese yeah but the animal was so out of its comfort zone that it put itself at risk and you at risk. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. So let, let, let's say somebody has a monitor and they've been doing this where they've been luring the animal around because they think they're giving it exercise, and which is a total, to me, it's like, oh, that, that made a lot of sense. I could see why someone would argue that, you know, you're mm -hmm. simulating them chasing a moth or something. Uh, how would you reframe that or, or re-execute that in order to like stimulate a similar response or or do you think that we should never be having like you know a monitor in the wild is going to be exploring and they're going to be you know robust running around exercising is there ways to do that in a way that's not going to have this negative emotional response from them i think that you need to get them to a place first where they don't feel um uncomfortable when you're in their presence i think a lot of people are kind of like skipping that step to get to the the fun bit which is getting them to run around without really thinking about the steps before that point um and there's no reason why rather than holding the tongue you can't throw that bug away from you and them to be encouraged to run away from you you still get that fun of them having exercise and things like that without them feeling the pressure of you being right there or them having to jump on you it seems like such like a people want the animal to be sat on them rather than just in the presence of them um yeah just it will happen just wait until the animal is comfortable that animal should be able to if you open the enclosure walk onto your lap and not feel stressed before you're asking them to do that with food as well yes okay that makes sense because I, I have seen that as well where people are working with an, a monitor clearly the monitor is incredibly comfortable with that keeper they open mm -hmm. the enclosure the monitor just you know skitters up their arm onto their shoulder and then is just happy to sit there and eat and they're not eating mm -hmm. and running back into their enclosure they're sort of eating out of the hands or the tongs that is that's the type of scenario that you want to see yeah, and the problem with luring is that it's so easy for you to, like you say, you lure them into a point and then you take three steps back when something negatively happens. Versus if you make an animal feel like you're listening to that repertoire, that you have that communication, they're more likely to just show you a sign of being like, I'm uncomfortable now, I want to stop. Then it will go in very quickly pear-shaped and you having to then spend months again getting to the point where you were yes so w with your own animals or for people who are listening if they want to a just n maybe not necessarily implement a training regime because not everybody you know wants to do that mm -hmm. but is is there w what are some easy ways to implement choice and, and just have because you this is i think the other thing that maybe people don't realize you are training your animal whether you want to do it or not mm -hmm. your interaction with the animal is the training every time so how do people make sure that they are hitting that positive reinforcement even just in their daily activities with the animals to make sure that the experience is getting more and more beneficial for them and that, that their animal and hopefully that animal becomes more comfortable with them are there things that you do with your collection that people can easily do 
As any reptile keeper knows, proper nutrition is a cornerstone of animal welfare in captivity. That's why I want to take a quick minute to tell you all about Zoomed's Dragon Food. Dragon Food is a specialized diet for bearded dragons. It comes in two formulations, one for juvenile animals and one for adult animals, and it is the result of three years of research and development. It is the first pet food to use green banana flour, which is a pesticide-free wheat alternative, which is low in sugar, and it's also a natural source of resistant starch, which feeds the microbiome in your dragon's gut. The product has a satisfying crunch, which simulates natural prey. As I already mentioned, it's wheat-free, it's also soy-free, and it uses real black soldier fly larvae for a high calcium protein source. If you own a bearded dragon and you're looking for a way to add some variety to their diet, please check out Zoomed's Dragon Food. For more information on this or any other Zoomed product, make sure you head to zoomed.com or check out the link in the show notes or the YouTube description. So um, it's there are behaviors that you can look out for to make sure that you're not pushing them above threshold. So everyone knows what um, fight or flight are, but there's actually four. There's fight, flight, fidget, and freeze. So... Um, when I first got my bearded dragon, she would show real fight behaviors. So she, every time I went near that enclosure, she would like puff up, hiss. Um, and you just work at what distance is comfortable for them and then slowly move up from there. So when an animal, I think like a lot of reptile keepers think, oh, if I work through the biting, it's going to stop. That's showing that actually the animal is way over that threshold. You should never get to that point, hopefully. Um and just have patience and faith. And one of the things that you can do is when the animal approaches and come forward, actually reward that by throwing the food behind them. So you're actually saying, thank you for coming forward, have your reward, go back to your safety. And a lot of the time you'll find that that animal very quickly becomes bolder. So they'll come forward more because they know that the reward is going to come at a distance that they feel comfortable. They can go back over there again. Mm -hmm. And it's just, building that up slowly so now the beard dragon she when i open the enclosure she'll come and sit on my knee like i don't feed her on my knee but she'll come and sit there so that then i can throw it away and she can go away and do something else and then come back and mm. um, and that feels so much more rewarding than having to lure the animal then as soon as it has the resource it's gone again you kind of build a better relationship by giving them the choice to come forward Yes. Yeah. And what about, you know, let's say the animal is scared of you and there's like a two or three foot threshold where the animal wants you to be. Can you, could you imagine where the animal maybe takes a step forward, even though you know you're afraid. So you step back as a reward. Would that be like a form of negative reinforcement where you're sort of alleviating the pressure by making more distance? Yeah. So a lot of the time you might um, come into, like say you've got two or three foot space the first sign that that animal's uncomfortable is it will freeze. And then as soon as that animal kind of like goes, oh, you're not doing anything, it kind of starts going back. That's when you leave. And you're like, okay, fine. So the next time you do that, that animal knows that you're not going to approach. And you can slowly like decrease that distance to the point where you're sat with the door open and they're doing their own thing. That's kind of what you're hoping for. And yeah, like you said, the reinforcement is you're, when they're doing their normal things, you'll just leave them alone. Yes. Yeah. What's that term? Is it antecedent? I'm really digging back into my my, my memories here. Is that a is that a training term? Anti, I, I think that's a term. I, I forget though. I, the, the sort of the experience that the animal's having right before whatever stimulus is, and I that that is something that's so easily to be unaware of. You know what is what like the jingling of the like for me. I, everything's locked here. I have a two year old, so you know the jingling of the key or the the sound of the. The, the, the cabinet thing unlocking like you don't think that of that is anything but to, to every single one of my animals that's a cue and actually i have to be a bit careful because for my boas that's a feeding cue they they, they that mm-hmm. is one of even though they know that sound doesn't always mean food they mean that every time they get food that sound happens so there's a chance that it can happen so there's this every animal is constantly logging those experiences and if you do the same thing in the same pattern and start to create a negative energy around whatever that is maybe it's the water dish that you're changing and you do it in such a way that creates a lot of stress for them they're going to pick up on that and it's going to be a learned response to whatever that thing is Mm -hmm. it's uh yeah it reminds me of when i was working i remember very briefly i was doing some work with horses and that was one thing with with horses is you you can't pull a horse and the harder you pull the harder they pull back and they're like 1500 pounds or a thousand pounds so it doesn't matter how hard you pull like you're nothing to them but you just put enough pressure on their halter that they that they can feel it 
And as soon as they step forward towards you, you immediately re- relieve the pressure. You're not continuing to pull them forward. You're letting them come to you a little bit and then you reward them by releasing the pressure. And then they understand that, oh, they want me to, you, you want me to walk with you because they don't want to walk against this, like, you know, having their chin tongue for, tugged forward. So you really do have to think about it from the mind of the animal, what their experience is. Yeah. There was something I was going to say about it now. Oh, uh, no, tr- training. I, I, I'll, I, I, it'll, it'll come back to me. So is there anything as, as far as, like, do you do any like target training or anything with your animals or, or do you just, um, oh, you do. Maybe you could tell us a little mm-hmm. bit about that. Yeah, so I try and as much as possible cover repertoires of like cooperative care with veterinary handling and things like that. Mm. So um, I try and encourage um, just free getting onto scales, for example. Um, my beardies will get targeted into like their carriers and things like that. Um, and as least stress as possible, um, just to kind of like do those routine things, um, pick them up um, or they step on my hands and then I will palpate their tummies and things like that. They're all things that allow you to health check them in a way that isn't like just grabbing and restraining them and things like that. Mm. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say about because you know, if you're dealing with dogs, for example, even though there's diff- different breeds of dogs, their behavior is so similar. You can, you understand the same with cats, but reptiles are, are, there's so many different reptiles and a lot of them are not even closely related at all. And I find with, like, because I have boas and I'm sure the ball pythons are similar, they're very subdue almost all the time. So you could, for me, if I yank one of my boas out of the enclosure, which I typically never would do, by the time you get them out, they seem calm, but that experience was, was probably not the best for them. So what, what quite often what I'll do, like you can see one over my shoulder. Or I always get this confused with this camera. But anyway, there's one up there. She's just, you know, basking underneath her light. If she wants to come out, I'll open the door and that's fine. And quite often if I'm doing water changes and things, I'll just leave the doors open. Sometimes they come out, sometimes they don't. But again, there's that choice of coming out and investigating if they want, giving them a new pathway so you're not invading their space and, and you know, rummaging around in their enclosure and, and, cre- and creating the disturbance. There is a reward of if they want to leave and go investigate, they can. If they're happy under the lamp, they can do that as well. But then you, you look at lizards or something that's going to be a lot more skittery if they're a nervous lizard. So that might be more obvious. But even with snakes like pythons and boas, they hide their fear a lot more unless they're extremely scared and they're actually like, you know, striking at you. The best part about providing high-quality reptile husbandry is you get to develop a long-term relationship with your animal. Meet Jackson, my 18-year-old crested gecko. Jackson lives on the BioDudes Terrafauna substrate, which is one of their substrates that's specifically designed for warm biomes and humidity spikes. Like all other BioDudes substrates, it contains organic content to help support the plant life in Jackson's vivarium. It also holds moisture very well, which means humidity is never an issue, even in my dry climate. Another favorite of mine is the BioDudes Bug Grub. This is a supplement powder made from natural ingredients like carrots, beets, spirulina, oats, and potatoes. Everybody knows how important gut-loading feeder insects is, and this simplifies it for me and allows me to be confident when I feed both Jackson and my tarantulas that they're getting the nutrients they need to thrive. Also, if you have a lot of babies right now, this is a great way to help fortify the diets of neonatal reptiles. The BioDude has a ton of great educational content on both his YouTube channel and the website all about bioactive care, and it's just one of those brands that's doing their part to push her pediculture into a positive direction and give reptile keeping a better name yeah but i feel like when you start to really know them i think you can like look and you can see they'll tense their muscles they're breathing they'll either stop breathing and they'll hold their breath or they'll start to like really rapidly breathe and things like Mm. that so even though like a reptile might be laying there or like your snake might be laying there and you think they're doing nothing they'll actually have like little subtle signs of like i'm getting ready for something um and obviously that can be quite hard sometimes when all you get is like a little head poking out of a hide just laying there. Um, but yeah, there's those little things that you can kind of, and like the tongue flicking, how rapid is that? How far reaching is that tongue? Um, is that a, their normal tongue flick or, or are you noticing that they're actually quite um, like very eager to kind of have an understanding of what's going on and things like that? Yes, yeah. For your snakes, do you do anything, when you feed them, are you... Do you do any puzzle feeding or any scent trailing or anything like that? Or are you typically just tong feeding? I'm just target training them at the moment. So, okay. yeah, I just focus on targeting. If it's um, things like um, I have a caliber python um, and she's a nest raider, then I'll just hide them in different places in the enclosure and she'll seek them out and things like that. Um, 
and the Antaresia, they really will go searching for it. But my Royal Pythons won't. So yeah, I just target train them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's sort of the same as my boas. I'll do, I'll sometimes hide the prey and they'll go find it. They're really bad at it, which is funny. It takes forever for them to find it because they're very like, visual. So if the, the prey isn't moving, it takes some time. But I think it is. Uh, but again, that goes back to, is that a positive experience for them? Or are they just like, what the hell's mm-hmm. going on here? There's a rat in this enclosure and it's really making me mad. It, it is hard to tell, but I don't know. So so maybe it's something you kind of have to do sparingly. Uh, but I do target change my 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 rat snake because he's very quick and very visual and he'll follow a target. And and so that that's a really fun, fun aspect of care. And I think that's something that anybody can implement in some capacity, whether it's puzzle feeders or whatnot. I do wonder about like frustration tolerances because we know, for example, in dogs and things like that, that it's something that you can build up. So a dog that, um, especially like hand rears and things, they, they've never been told no to a resource like food or anything like that. So when you, um, for example, are trying to train impulse control and things like that, they really struggle because they haven't got a frustration tolerance. Um, whilst as I wonder if it's the same with our reptiles, they've, if they've never experienced before having to go and look for the food because they're constantly given it, there is an element, there will be an element of frustration there. But is that something that if we build it up gradually and we make it slightly harder and harder and harder, is it actually positive for them? Yes, there will be frustration there, but also their meal in the wild doesn't come wandering along and, and straight into their faces. So, yeah, it's it's weighing it up, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I think, again, you sort of just have to choose. Is that too much time they've spent looking for this thing? Is that... Do, and in in that capacity, you sort of do have to anthropomorphize. You know, is that a frustrating experience? But I think frustration and effort is not a bad thing in small doses, right? Especially if there's a reward at the end. I mean, that's the that's what gives people value. I mean, you don't play video game. People who play video games don't play them because they're easy. They play them because they're hard, and they get frustrated, and they eventually. Pass, well, I don't play games, so people can probably already tell. But you pass the level or whatever it is, and you get this uh, you know excitement, which I imagine an animal there's still those same reward centers in their brain. So as long as it's not super frustrating and then no reward at the end, you know, that might be a real negative experience. But, but speak, you know, listen to you talk about dogs. I remember we had a family member who had a dog and she was just, everything she did was this positive reinforcement. And it was so annoying because that dog, all she, she would just look at your pockets all the time because she wanted you to give her treats. And like, so I can imagine that dog had very low frustration tolerance because she was so used to getting a little uh, uh, niblet of food for every single thing that she did. It was like, I'd let her outside and then she, now she wants a treat. I'm like, you're 10 years old. How many, like you need treats for your whole life for this. <laughs> and so and maybe that's like taking positive reinforcement too far. I don't know. And I think like a lot, I've had conversations with people with, where they're like, oh, I would, but what about like vet care and things like that? And it's like, not every experience that an animal has can be force-free. Like there are sometimes when you do have to just be like, you know what, you've got to go to the vet, you're sick. Like, mm-hmm. um, and usually um, I'll do a cue for that where like, for example, with the snakes, if there's no um, choice involved, if they're not allowed to choose whether or not they can or come out, they've got to come out, then I'll use a snake hook. There's like some precursor to be like, today we don't have a choice. We're we're going yes. to the vet now. Yes. Um, and so, I, it's something that Laura and I spoke about on that. Yeah, it's about minimizing those those moments you know if you if you can reduce that to maybe a couple times a year rather than every time you change waters or or whatever it is i think that's ideal and and i've said this before anybody who has a a child will know that you want to be supportive of them you want to be positively reinforcing what they do but you know the other day my son had a temper tantrum because he wanted to drive home and and (laughs) he's he's three feet tall and he's two so you know you, you have to put him in the car seat even though he doesn't want to there are moments where it's like buddy we can't ride our bike naked you know th- those are things that <laughs> you have to you unfortunately are going to have to apply some force in that way but you can also learn to avoid those scenarios and hopefully you know f- with a child set them up for set their environment up in a way that allows them to choose to do the right thing and i mm-hmm. think animals are, are no different you can set their environment up in a way whether it's you know shifting into a box where they're going to eventually do the thing and yeah, their choice happens to be the choice that you wanted them to make, but the 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 from their experience, it's it's a lot more, it, it's a lot more beneficial for their well being. Mm-hmm. 
Well, speaking of Lori and speaking of this topic, why don't we t- do you want to talk a little bit about the ball python study? Yeah. Yeah. We can talk so about. I think it's been about a year since we've talked about it on the podcast before. Liam had mentioned it when he was on last summer. And this was a, a giant project associated with just learning about ball python behavior in captivity, essentially. Do you want to set the stage for us about what this is and then, and then how far you guys took it? Like, just, just, just give us the abstract of this study. So um, my background in actually doing studies is spread of participation index, which is an SPI. Um, it's something that I'm really, really interested in, which is basically mapping out an animal space and finding out exactly how they use it. Um, and it highlights to you what kind of resources they really value. So why are they using that hide? Do they always use that hide? Do they always use this branch or not? They never touch that, so there's no point in it being there. Um, and so we've um, we wrote out a methodology um, had it ethically approved in the UK to do any kind of study you need an ethical panel um, to determine whether or not um, the method is not only suitable for animals and there's no suffering or anything like that but also it's not excessive so I couldn't say do it on a, like a hundred royal pythons they would deem that to be excessive um, and then so we managed to get 16 participants who we've all collected the data now. Um, and then it's just me currently sat number crunching, trying to figure out the, um, yeah, all of the data. Yeah. That's the fun. That's the the fun part. Actually, it'll be the fun part for us to read once you're done. C- can you, can you tell us essentially how the experiment worked? I mean, you have these 16 animals. How are, how are they kept? Where were they? I know they were all, all across different places. Like how did those participants actually get involved? And then, how did the data get collected? Yeah, so um, we had 16 participants that were, they came from um, Laurie's Patreon. They wanted to do, uh, participate in um, citizen um, science, which is always amazing. Um, and what was the question? Where did we go? Wait, I'll, I'll, I'll remind you of the questions in a second, but as, as you say that... Um, I thought of another thing. Was the study, like you said, it had to go through the the ethics board. Did it actually have to go through an ethics board even though it was like citizen science? Like did Lori have a, an official channel for this to be reviewed? It was me. Um, in the UK, oh, We I had to go through um, one of my old tutors at my old university to have an ethics board um, approve of it because otherwise you're not allowed to publish it in a journal. Um, okay. own, there's like a difference between white literature and grey literature. Um, and in order for us to get into the white literature, it had to be ethically reviewed. Okay. So the plan is to actually have this published in a peer reviewed journal for, for other people. Okay. So that answers that question. So yeah, the rest of those questions were, um, so there were Laurie's patrons. So most of those were in the States, I, I imagine. How, how are they kept? I think you guys controlled mm-hmm. that as far as their enclosure and setup, and then how how did you guys collect the data as you know in the spatial data? Yeah, so the um, all of the snakes were kept in exactly the same. So even though um, the majority of them were all across America, and one of mine was in the UK, we had um, very kindly um, lots of just different sponsors donate enclosures. So I think some came from Dubia. Who else? Oh, Zoomed <laughs> um, donated for us and um, these different brands to make sure they all had the exact same lighting, the exact same hides, um, the exact same water bowls. They had a sky hide um, and all of this had to be measured out. So I had to get like a little tape measure and exactly measure every single area, square and surface area so that when I do my mathematics in the data analysis, then I'll be able to get numbers from it. Um, and then over eight weeks, we had participants do um, visual observations for four hours. Um, one was from um, 8 p.m. until 2 a.m. And another one, no, it was 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. And then another one was 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So we had a night shift and a day shift so that hopefully we'll get not only um, them active during the night time but also then when the lights were on as well whether or not they were basking because they had uvb and things like that so those that four hour window so for eight weeks for two times per day does that mean that the um, person who, oh yeah go ahead it was so it was one session during the day one session during the night per week so we <laughs> weren't that mean 
Okay, okay. So so <laughs> if it, let's just say you're it was the night it was the day shift for you this week between 10 and 2. Does that mean you had to just put your eyes on the enclosure at some point during that 4-hour window? So it was every 15 minutes, uh, oh every 10 God. minutes you had to go back and look and then we recorded where they were, what behavior doing and what they were interacting with and we also um, split the enclosure into like a quadrant of four so are they off the floor are they like up or are they down on the floor was all like different data points that we were kind of collecting as well so so you obviously made it so th- the data that you're getting is cohesive so you, you you gave the participants the language to use and the the spatial coordinate to use and so they would just say okay sky hide top whatever ha- ha- you know sleeping in the sky hide or however it was just so you, you don't want to be going through like data of how does the data look on your end basically is my question yeah so it's an excel spreadsheet and it's got um all of the times like mapped out and then they had to go down and be like so the animal is in zone 13 and which might be your sky hide and then they had to say either is out of view so we don't know what it's doing because you can't say an animal is sleeping in its hide because we can't see what it's doing and so they might say it's out of sight in its hide and that hide was in the top c- corner of the viv, so it was in quadrant A, and they would okay. have to record that every ten minutes. Wow! So that is a crazy amount of commitment. Did some people <laughs> yeah. just set up a camera to review the footage after, or was like was that allowed? So we had this massive. Um, we were going to set up cameras that were going to be recorded, so that we could um, not have to have them be there. We could come back to it at another time. Um, but unfortunately the cameras weren't capturing the movement of the snakes. We couldn't get it to record for the whole four hours and then have the footage downloaded. So that some people had a camera set up that they were looking at the snakes through the camera so they didn't disturb them as they were walking around. But no, they had to be there present for the whole wow. time. So that yeah. is a crazy amount of commitment, especially those four weeks of being up between 10 and 2. Like you can't sleep. You got to be up there for every 10 minutes to go take a look. Like that is crazy. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah. I mean, for Lori, that's like she doesn't sleep at nighttime, so that doesn't matter. But for most people, that's pretty intense. And Lori didn't have one snake in the study. She had multiple snakes. I don't know how she does it. She's walking around with a clipboard. <laughs> yeah. that's. I mean, she, quite often Lori will send me a message when I'm up for my day and she's about to go to bed. That's how uh, committed she is to, to watching her nocturnal animals. So I know you've not crunched the data yet. So I, I would like to know if if the, is there any preliminary indication of what you saw, or is it too early for that? And then second, when do you think is there a, an ETA as far as publishing? So, in terms of the data, they were very much like um, snake specific. So it was actually really nice to see that they all had like little individual personalities. So my um, snake Nana, he um, was pretty much active from the time the lights went out until um 2 a.m he was cruising climbing doing all sorts of different things whilst some of the participants um just would like poke their head out of um the hide and then go back in again so um it'd be really interesting i'm we've got a we tried to have data that was really varied so we've got some snakes are actually quite young we've got some that are really old we've got some that are wild caught we've got um some that have always been raised in iraq and this is their first experience in a viv so um it's going to be really interesting to see if there's if I can map out like are there differences between those or cohesively did it even matter? Mm. And then as far as an, an ETA, is this something that's going to take a long time to crunch? Um, it is because I've just been um, informed that I have to move from my home, so right. <laughs> so there might be a little bit of hold on the number crunching. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, but I've got to move first. But yeah, yeah. hopefully. Um, now is the number crunching but we should get the ball rolling a little bit more and then will for for authors on the paper will it be you and Lori or or everybody that participated or how does that work um so unfortunately yes the participants don't have a a name on the paper it will be me Lori Liam and then my the person the tutor who helped me um his name will also be on the paper okay Cool. So, so when you, because you were obviously one of the ones that actually also observed at, during the, the nighttime window, did you just commit to staying awake for four hours or did you like set an alarm for every 10 minutes? How did you do that? 
yeah, no, I um, I stayed awake. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, um, as a uh, as a morning person, I can't fathom. I cannot fathom doing that. See, I'm um a night person, so that was fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's really cool. I mean, I, I can't. O- I can only imagine the implications that this will have. I mean, of course, people say, "Oh, it's only sixteen snakes." What, whatever. I mean, it, it's a, it's, it's the most intensive behavioral ball python study coming from her pediculture community ever. I would think, and it's, it's probably the first time that anybody in the, in the hobby really has taken the time to do something like this. And I think it will be fascinating to see, even if it just says they sleep in a, if they are in fact the pet rock that everybody claims them to be. That would be interesting to know as well, but I have a feeling that we're going to see a lot more activity from them than some people might think. It's going to be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Part of it, like, I tried really, really hard to be as unbiased as I was writing the paper, doing the ethograms. Um, we had to, like, obviously train everyone to do behavior observations and things like that, try and make it as um, cohesive as possible. Um, but yeah, I'm trying really, really hard to just look at the data as it is and try and not get put my thoughts into what I would want out of it. Yeah, exactly. And that's how a proper scientist should approach an experiment. So I think that's really cool. Ellie, this this is uh, it's, it's fascinating talking to you. I mean, I, 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 the, the, like I said at the beginning, I think the, the conversation around welfare really scares people. And, you know, it can take dark turns because we do have to talk about some of the negativities that come along with keeping animals in captivity. But I think someone like you is perfect because, yeah, you, you, you're you talking about welfare, but you keep reptiles. So it's clear that you're not an anti-person that doesn't want us to have animals at all. But you're also taking the next step on top of it and actually participating and, 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 and facilitating experiments to help us understand our animals better. And I think that can only be a good thing. Is there anything that we didn't cover today that you wanted to make sure we, we talked about before we wrapped up? Not that I can think of. <laughs> I think we, 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 you know what? We never even talked about um, your your YouTube channel. You actually have a channel and, and some of the animals that you keep. You, you did mention some of them. So maybe we'll just wrap up with kind of the, your own personal hobby. Uh, what do you have in your reptile room right now? You, you mentioned that you have to move, so you're going to be experiencing each one of those animals <laughs> uh, right away. <laughs> Yeah, I have um, quite a large collection in my eyes at the moment. Um, I've got um, a Jackson's chameleon. I've got stenodactylus, stenodactylus geckos, which are really interesting. I'm trying to do um, social communication behavior on them to see like little different interactions. And I've also got um, scorpion geckos, um, viper geckos, a crested gecko spyro, um, anteresia, um, white street frogs, um, milk frogs, too many royal pythons, <laughs> a caliber python, um, the villiards, chameleon geckos as well, oh. Pac-Man frog. I think that's everything. It's a good assortment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's the hard part about finding a new place when you come with uh, 20 pets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm quite excited. Oh, I know I have a corn snake. Mm. <laughs> um, the new place um, that we're going to be moving into is I'm going to have a dedicated reptile room. So everyone's getting kind of upgrades and yeah, so I'm feeling positive. Yeah. And that's the other thing that when we talk about the the welfare side is it, it costs money to increase welfare quite often, you know, making more space or whatever it is. So the, the, I, uh, what I want, always want to kind of underlie the welfare conversation is is not to feel guilty about you know how you've kept in the past or how you currently keep, but just trying your best to improve any way you can. If it's these small, and that's actually what that video had mentioned. Even even at the zoo level, taking baby steps is the is the the biggest key in this. And it's not to make people feel ashamed or bad. It's to, to say, okay, the, the animal clearly has some experience in captivity and. No, we cannot know exactly what that experience is, but we certainly can figure out ways to make that experience better. I think it's pretty black and white that you can have a bad experience, a negative experience and a positive experience. And in the reptile world, we tend to, especially, I hate to say like the old school keepers, but it's pretty common from a group of people who've been keeping a long time that these animals actually don't have the ability to perceive their environment, which is clearly wrong. And I think that the stu- the ball python study will be a perfect example of that. So 
Um, anyway, I don't know what that tangent was about besides just <laughs> it's kind of summarizing the conversation. You, you know, you, you'd also, so the other thing I, I wanted to make sure we chat about is your YouTube channel. I don't know how much you're going to be active on it in the next couple of months as you get ready to move, but can you let people know, do you have plans with the channel moving forward? Is there something, is there projects that you have kind of in mind for it? Yeah, I think um, hopefully once kind of I'm set up, I'm going to try and get myself a space to actually get a desk and things like that to actually dedicate time to the YouTube channel. Um, I would love to dedicate it to doing more of the things that I'm really interested in, like the um, how to do the um, consent-based handling and how to um, start reading the behavior and those kind of things to kind of start focusing on. Mm, I think that'd be awesome. That, that, that'd be a that's much needed. You know, we have Lori doing that, but more of that is always good because there's not enough of that. So that, that, that'll be fantastic. And I think you and Liam are going to fire back up your podcast at some point when you get back mm-hmm. settled. So that'll be something for people to look forward to as well. Cool. Yeah. Can you let everybody know what the YouTube channel name, anywhere they can find you on Instagram or anything else, any, any uh, online place where you exist? Yeah. So I'm Hills Heptiles. I'm on YouTube, um, TikTok, Instagram. Um, yeah, it's all kind of like, there's not a lot going on there at the moment, but there is going to be soon, hopefully. Awesome. And, and w- when the SPI study is published, I imagine that might be something that you talk about on the YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm sure people will be really excited to hear that. So anyway, in the meantime, Ellie, thank you so much for finally being on the podcast as a guest. I know people are always like, we want to hear more from Ellie. So I'm so glad that we we're able to, to have this hour <laughs> today for, for you to chat and, and we'll have you on again in the future, especially once that study's out, maybe we can break it down a little bit further. So until then, thank you very much for, for being on the show. Thank you. All right, that is the end of that episode. Ellie, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast and telling us your story and jumping into welfare. Again, that's a topic that not a lot of people want to discuss. It's a terrifying topic for some people, so I was glad that you could come on and and simplify it for us. The training stuff was also fascinating, and I think I can speak for everybody when I say we cannot wait to see the published results of that SPI study. What, whether it doesn't matter which way it goes, I think it's going to be fascinating to see how those animals are using their environment and how and if there is differences between the younger animals, the wild caught animals, the, ta- the the rack animals. It's going to be interesting. I cannot wait to see that. Listeners, thank you for listening. If you did enjoy it, sharing it on social media really does go a long way to help find new listeners. I know there's many reptile keepers out there that won't have heard of the podcast that I think will benefit from this episode. So if you can share it, that would be fantastic. If you'd like to support us uh, financially, you can do that at patreon.com com slash animals at home that money basically goes right to editing editing the show is not cheap it's a lot of work to edit the show so if you do want to help support the podcast and help me continue to produce the show patreon is the best way to do that you also have instant access to the discord server if you do that and early access to episodes and i think that is it for this one everyone i will catch you in the next episode